Hello and welcome to another episode of Podcast DX, the show that brings you interviews with people just like you, whose lives were forever changed by a medical diagnosis. I'm Lita. And I'm Ron. Jean Marie is not with us. She's got a migraine today. And collectively, we are the hosts of Podcast DX. On today's show, we are going to learn about idiopathic hypersomnia. Our guest today is Diana. Diana was diagnosed with idiopathic hypersomnia, or IH, in 2010 after years of searching for a diagnosis. She started advocating for IH awareness when she found support for hypersomnia was very limited. In 2014, Diana started a support group that meets monthly in Atlanta for those with hypersomnia and their supporters as well. She also coordinates a yearly support retreat called Snooze Cruise. Hello, Diana. Let's hear about this. Hi, Diana. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Wonderful. Diana, what exactly is idiopathic hypersomnia? Idiopathic hypersomnia or hypersomnulence is characterized by reoccurring episodes of excessive daytime sleepiness or prolonged nighttime sleep. It's a neurological disorder, and it's usually a lifetime chronic disease, which is often debilitating. In my case, I can look back and see the symptoms in my childhood and teenage years, and now that I'm diagnosed, I continue to suffer from my age. Well, what causes idiopathic hypersomnia? Idiopathic hypersomnia is believed to be caused by pathology within the brain, but it's not, the exact cause is not known. Hmm. Okay. And what, uh, what are the symptoms? Uh, my symptoms are excessive daytime sleepiness, confusion, brain fog, uh, memory problems, um, just to name a few. Okay. And how would they diagnose such a thing? Historically, idiopathic hypersomnia is very difficult to diagnose. According to the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke, there are between 130,000 and 200,000 people with narcolepsy here in the United States. However, there may be rather more cases that continue to go underdiagnosed. So, in my is, yeah, go ahead. But I was just curious: is idiopathic hypersomnia then considered to be a form of narcolepsy? Right now, they consider it separate. Um, it may have some similarities with narcolepsy two, which is narcolepsy without cataplexy. Okay. But currently, it has its own diagnosis code. Okay, and then how, you were going to say, how, how were you diagnosed? Uh, I had started with uh, a neurologist who had sent me for several overnight sleep studies. Um, and after being inconclusive sleep apnea, I was ordered by a sleep doctor to do an MSLT, which is a multiple sleep latency test. And that's when I was officially diagnosed with idiopathic hypersomnia. Well, how long did it take for you to get the diagnosis? Um, precisely, it's hard to say. For two or three years, I knew that there was something wrong, but just couldn't put my finger on it and wasn't really able to articulate it to a doctor. After about three or four years, I became to see, search out that diagnosis, and I was officially diagnosed probably after about eight years. Wow. And what were some of the symptoms that uh, you were having? What gave you the indication? Um, I just felt uh, rather off tired, groggy. I almost felt somewhat like I was drugged or on large doses of Benadryl. Um, okay. It became harder not to fall asleep when I was not supposed to. Mm-hmm. Well, that's not safe. <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> no. Are there any diagnostic tests out there to help healthcare providers diagnose this disease? The most important one is actually of your sleep, carried out in a specialist sleep center. The study usually involves staying overnight at a sleep center so your sleep patterns can be analyzed. During the night, several different parts of your body will be carefully monitored using electrodes and bands that are placed on the surface of your body while you sleep. Sensors will also be placed on your legs, and an oxygen sensor, sensor is attached to your finger. A number of different tests will be carried out during a polysomnogram, including an EEG and EMG. These monitor brain waves and eye movement. Okay. Uh, is it hard to sleep when you get all this stuff hooked up to you? Um, 
believe it or not, uh, the several that I have gone to, I was almost falling asleep while they were hooking me up. Um, <laughs> okay. and of course, I then again, I guess if you have fine. this problem, maybe it's easy to fall asleep. Some people, there is a certain amount of discomfort um, and anxiety that kicks in, and they don't do well, and they sleep really different than they would at home. Okay. So it's um, it, it's a it's a, a test that is very inconclusive in some ways. Okay, all right. Uh, and then you say that they they monitor your brain waves, your breathing, and your eye movement. What does that tell them? Uh, does it tell them if you're actually sleeping or not? I mean, I don't understand how they can. What are they looking it all, for? It's, it's um, how long you're sleeping, the quality of sleep, if you go into REM, um, the number of times you awake during an hour. Um, several things that tell them the, the quality of sleep. Um, and then when you do a MSLT, you do a series of naps where you're basically, over the course of an eight-hour day, asked to just go down and take a nap. And they measure how quickly you fall to, in, in, to a deep sleep. Okay. And normally, if a person sleeps well through the night, well, you shouldn't be able to fall asleep in less than seven or five minutes for a nap. Okay. Okay. Uh, and you say that you've had several of these sleep study tests before they actually diagnosed you? Uh, I did, because they kept sending me for the just the night study, which basically kept telling them that I was sleeping great and I wasn't registering any sleep apnea. Oh, it see. wasn't until they sent me for the day study that they realized, wow, I'm so extremely tired and I'm falling asleep in less than an average of four minutes Okay. with five naps. Right. I'm trying to figure out what's the, is there a, a difference between uh, idiopathic hypersomnia and narcolepsy? It seems like they're very uh, similar. They are. They're very, there's a lot of overlap. Uh, the big difference is um, narcolepsy has a lack of cyclocretin in your spinal fluid, and it also can have something called cataplexy, uh, which is basically your body is just um, seized by sleep and you just fall out either by sleep or emotions like uh, laughter or crying. Okay, okay. But there, yeah, like you're saying, that there's a lot of overlap. So uh, it would be difficult Much to especially. pinpoint, right, to pinpoint exactly which it is. Is is this yes. is this uh, disorder considered to be something that would uh, allow you to get on a medical disability rating? Yes, yes. Um, I'm actually somebody who's on disability for idiopathic hypersomnia. Okay. What what can you do to live a little bit easier with this condition what you know there's probably not any um real cures but what can you do that helps your life day to day um some starts with just some good sleep hygiene um trying to get that better night's rest avoiding alcohol caffeine smoking strenuous exercise or large meals before bedtime uh it's it's very important to establish a bedtime routine Whenever possible, you should go to bed and wake up at the same time every day. You may also want to try relaxing before bed. Uh, meditation, yoga, warm bath can help. Uh, keeping your bedroom free of distractions, uh, especially like a cell phone or any um, device. Um, some people use a sleep mask to help as well. A, a what now? These are not cures. A sleep mask, um, you know, an eye mask. So oh, it sure, helps sure. You as okay. well. Or, or the, yeah, the the blackening curtains? To... Yes, those help too. Those okay. help too. Um, none of this is a cure, but along with this and some help with your general practitioner or sleep specialist, you can come up with a schedule that will help you a little bit throughout the day. I would imagine that um, people that have jobs that are off cycle, uh, for instance, people that work, work third shift, they must have quite the problem uh, with sleep period, and if they have this idiopathic hypersomnia, uh, it would be really hard for them because, you know, during the day there's noises, there's daylight, there's, uh, you know, everybody's awake and, and active, and, and you got to sleep. I mean, that's got to be even harder for them. Absolutely. Uh, anybody who has, like, a shift disorder, um, and then hypersomnia along with that, is it's very difficult to, to get that breakfast. Um, right, right. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. How? When did you find out about your diagnosis? Uh, officially in 2010. Okay. All right. So you've been on disability since then? Uh, no, it took several years. Um, disability didn't go into effect in, in 2016. Uh, oh. Many years in denials. Um, I wasn't approved until the um, basically the hearing stage, which is your last stage. So wow. you got diagnosed in 2010, and you weren't approved for mm -hmm. disability until 2016? That's yes. terrible. That's terrible. Yes. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And many are denied uh, because it's not really in the uh, a diagnosis that the disability department recognizes. Uh, narcolepsy is, but idiopathic hypersomnia is not. So you had to fight for it. Uh, yes, I uh, I had to after my second denial. I had to get a lawyer to help to keep track sure. of the paperwork and sure. the time of strength and things like that. Well, thank God you got uh, you got through that system. Uh, in you. addition to the steps that you've listed, uh, has has there been any medication that would help relieve your symptoms? Uh, some. The first difficulty is finding a medication that not only works but that insurance will cover. Um, there's no FDA medication that's covered for idiopathic hypersomnia. So a lot of things that would help say someone with narcolepsy with the same diagnosis or symptoms, they would get denied because they don't have a narcolepsy diagnosis. So um, oh, you're, that's you just fall between the cracks one. everywhere. You, yeah, we absolutely do. So there's um, there's that problem. There's a lot of people who use stimulants, but they cannot get them covered. Um, for me, stimulants don't work. <laughs> uh, it almost makes me feel fake awake, where I'm forced to be awake. Mm -hmm. um, I'm currently using a drug called somazinol, which is a compounded drug. I also use Wellbutrin for wakefulness and bac Baclofen, which helps consolidate my sleep at night. Okay. And how did the... Um how did this diagnosis affect your ability to work or uh, affect your social life? Uh, it's debilitating. Uh, my social life, uh, it affects it because it's hard to make plans and keep them. Um, even when I make them, I have an anxious or uncomfortable feeling. Am I going to be um, foggy off? Is my memory going to be affected more so than any other day? Mm -hmm. uh, am I just going to be too tired? Um, so that's, that's hard, and I, and I always prefer to have a supporter with me that knows my symptoms and my difficulties. Um, as far as work, it became totally... Um, the hardest part about work is when I can do something, how I can do it. So, you know, I might have been able to do things for a short period of time. I just can't tell you what period of the day or week that I would be able to pull that off. So working any job um, becomes, becomes difficult. So it would have to be work on your timetable, not necessarily the boss's timetable. Exactly. And that's really, that's really hard to find right. Um, right. in right. any job. Yeah, that's, mm -hmm. that's difficult with chronic illness. For example, you know, yeah. Jean is not with us today to tape because she's got a migraine. You never know when it's going to hit, but when it hits, exactly. she can't do anything about it. She's just stuck in bed with ice. Exactly. I always say that um, it's not that I don't want to do things. It's just that all too often IH has its own plan. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, what advice would you have for our listeners out there that might have IH or might think they have IH? Uh, the best thing to do is try to find a doctor that's familiar with idiopathic hypersomnia. Um, you can do that by social media, contacting other people that maybe can help you find a doctor in your area. The Hypersomnia Foundation, which you can okay. find at hypersomniafoundation.com. They have a list of doctors. Perfect. We'll um, put that, basically, yeah, we'll put that link on our website. Support. Okay. Yeah, find support uh, both medically and take someone to the doctor with you that is aware of your symptoms and can help communicate that with the doctor. Okay, great, great. Well, thank you very much for joining us on our show today. Uh, we really appreciate all the insight. It's something that I mean, I've never heard of, I never knew existed before we talked to you. So uh, this opens my eyes and I'm sure it'll open up the eyes of many of our listeners and they might be thinking, hmm, I think I might have a problem and I think I'm going to follow up on this. So thank you. Well, thank yes, you. Thank you, thank so, you much. so much for having me. All right. Thank you.
And if our listeners have any questions or comments related to today's show, they can certainly contact us at podcastdx at yahoo.com, through our website, podcastdx.com, on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, or Instagram. And if you have a moment to spare, please give us a five-star review wherever you get your podcast. As always, please keep in mind that this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health care provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition or treatment and before undertaking a new health care regime and never ever disregard professional medical advice or delaying seeking it because of something you have heard on this podcast. Till next week. Bye.